Hello everybody, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement, and I'm here with Georgie from uh, NUS. But before we start, just want to acknowledge the land that uh, we meet on and acknowledge our Indigenous uh, uh, elders, past, present and emerging, and make a special uh, note of Indigenous students and reflect on um, their accomplishments and their struggles in uh, getting a tertiary uh, education. Georgie, can you tell us about yourself and NUS? Yes, so my name's Georgie and I use she, her pronouns. Um, so I come from the wonderful NUS, which stands for the National Union of Students. So the National Union is the peak representative body for tertiary students across Australia. Um, we represent over a million students. Um, you know, some of them don't necessarily know we represent them, but we do. Um, we have, you know, we focus on many number of things, but particularly um, in the, you know, fighting for education. Um, we know that this government has given us, you know, has just given this sector a real run for its money and survival um, over the last 10 years. Uh, and we also fight very much for the welfare of students um, and making sure that they are heard and listened to at a governmental level, um, but also on a campus level. Excellent. When, when you said the, the joke about how you like you represent a million students, some of them don't know you're representing them. What is the engagement level like with students? Um, look, I think, so the way that we are funded is we go, so every, most universities will have student unions or they'll have guilds or they'll have associations. They take on some sort of that name. Um, they we have 39 of those campuses are affiliated to the NUS. Um, so they pay a small amount of money every year to us to help fund us, the, like the NUS. Um, I think due to um, attacks we saw in 2004, of VSU, which was the introduction of voluntary student unionism. So normally, like back in back in the old day, it was compulsory for everyone to be part of their student union. Um, and as a result, we had a lot more funding. Um, we were able to do a lot of really cool things, and you know, they were much more part of student life. Um, since the introduction of VSU, we've really been fighting for survival. So our all of our funding has been restructured. So now instead of us getting SAF, so Student Services Amenities Fee, which is a fee that every student has to pay um, as a semester. Some of them, it's on their HEX fees. Some of them, they have to pay it straight up. Um, and it's capped at like 350, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so instead of that money going directly to the student union to be able to pay for counseling and legal advocacy and parties and all of these other things, um, it goes directly to the university and then the student unions have to negotiate with the university for our funding, um, which means that like university, like my student, I go to La Trobe University in Melbourne um, and our student union, the lovely LTSU over here, uh, our funding got cut from $2.8 million to $275,000 in one Whoa. year, which meant massive staff cuts. It meant, you know, a, a student union that is on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, and, you know, it also meant like a depleted ability to be a union. You do need funding to a certain extent to be able to fight these massive institutions that are universities. Um, so I'm kind of droning on here, no, but no, um, basically um, as a result of that, you know, universities like the LTSU aren't able to give the NUS funding, which also makes it hard for us to be a national union um, and makes it really hard for us to like push forward campaigns um, and, you know, get awareness of like what we're doing. Um, we try regardless, but it's still hard. So that's why it's wonderful to be able to partake in things like this where some random students who might not necessarily be engaged with their student union might be able to find out a little bit more. Excellent. And for those that will watch this, get involved with, uh, with, with, with uh, NUS. Can you tell us about some of the campaigns that you work on? Yes. Um, so... I suppose the big campaign that we're working on at the moment is our election campaign. So our election campaign is called It's Time for Change, um, which is a reference to 
many, many different um, campaigns throughout the year, but I think is quite frankly at its core statement about the fact that, you know, we are as a sector very, very unhappy with our current government um, and the policies that are being forward and something needs to change. So I'm an old man. I can remember Gough Whitlam's um, campaign yeah. this time. So I just thought I'd mention how old I am. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. So, I mean, I suppose it is reference to the it's, it's time from Gough Whitlam. You know, he was the one that introduced free education. Um, and that is one of our chaos. The other part of it, though, is um, the change part is change the rules, which was a massive unions campaign, um, which, you know, we also wanted to pay homage to. Um, but yes, I suppose coming into that is free ed and fighting for funding for education and fighting for um, funding for our student unions, which I touched on before, is one of our key campaigns and key asks coming into the election. Um, SAF reform wouldn't cost governments any money. It would, it's a legislative change that they made um, where, you know, the they could very, very easily change it. Um, so we're just, that's a key part of that. But it's also, you know, which the other part of it is like actual funding for our university. So the Job Ready Graduates Package, if anyone remembers, came through in 2020. Basically, it meant that if you were doing like an arts degree, um, your fees, so the fees for like the generation below us, below you, um, were going to massively increase. So my brother is paying double the hex that I am for, you know, a relatively similar degree because of this package. Um, they fees increased by 110%. Um, the, the reason they put forward is they wanted it to be a jobs ready graduates. You know, they, they're, they're all about the jobs coming out of the pandemic. And I get that. But the point was, is that it also continued to rip money from other parts. So they decreased the fees on like a teaching degree, right? They actually became cheaper under job ready graduates, but they didn't supplement that funding that the universities were losing because they made the degrees cheaper. They just left it, right? So that meant that universities just got absolutely gutted for funding. Um, and so a big, you know, we, we need more money. Uh, in the university sector, we saw massive job cuts, especially for staff. We're working a lot with the NTEU, which is the National Tertiary Education Union, for all of like the teachers and staff that work in universities, because um, they're doing EBA negotiations at the moment. And there's some massive strikes happening across the country, especially at UCIT, um next week, if anyone's interested. But um, so that's something we're really looking at. With free education. Yes. When you talk to people about it, I, I'm, I'm guessing most students support it, if not all. Yeah. And I, the public? What's I think the public's sceptical. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, it's not a completely far off policy. We have both UAP uh, and, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that I'm relatively one way politically leaning, but that in no way represents the, like, the views of the NUS are very... Ooh. clean and you know at the end of the day we've endorsed both policies in that UAP have endorsed free education or clearing student mm -hmm. debt and so have the Greens so you have both parts of the political spectrum. Yeah, it's a broad church and I can say that because this is the Australian and Christian movement so the reference is really relevant broad church. <laughs> so true um, so we have these both sides of these political spectrums have said that this is a good idea um, and it's not that far off. If we put a 10% tax uh, on the fossil fuel industry, we would be able to fund free university education in Australia. Like, it's not that ridiculous. Um, like a 10% tax. It's not like we're, you know, completely taking all of it, you know. It, it's just insane. Um, but it is something... I think parents, because there are so many, like this generation that's in uni now, their parents still got university for free. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of hypocritical of them to then say, oh, no, that's ridiculous, that would cost too much money because, well, you didn't have to deal with it. And I think the point is, is that free education um, would like it's not going to make that much of a difference from, you know, someone that, you know, perhaps had quite a privileged background and was able to go to a private school and, you know, 
if they're not able to get into their law degree the first time or get a um, commonwealth supported place, like their parents might be able to fund them to do that, right? Mm -hmm. But it is going to make a difference to, you know, someone that's coming from the outer suburbs that, you know, finally got into a GOA university, um, you know, if they're, they're going to rack up, you know, $50,000 of student debt trying to get a law degree, um, you know, they're six years, they're not, you know, like they're, they're, they're decent sized degrees. Mm -hmm. um, if you're able to, like, they're going to carry that debt for a really long time and it disproportionately financially hurts them. Um, and it's the same for women. It's the same for, um, you know, people of colour. It's like there's all of, people with disability, like all of these layers intersectionally are going to make it harder to pay off your hex. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah. So I think those students are very much like, hell yeah, like I don't want to be carrying this debt for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. It's something that, you know, is a real prospect. So free education, more funding to universities. Are there other campaigns that you focus yeah. on? Sorry. Um, the other one is, um, so climate justice, um, we want better climate policies from the major parties. It's um, fairly like clear to explain, I think at the end of the day, we need. Um, Can I ask you a silly question about that? We, we keep hearing that, you know, climate justice is getting a tremendous amount of support, you know, record numbers and protests. Of all the issues, uh, why do you think that one has so uh, resonated with, with people? Especially, young people? It's a question that I've thought about a lot. Um, I don't necessarily, like, I think at the end of the day, it's people see it as a life and death thing. Uh, it's students know that it's going to affect them so much more. I think it's like how some people take the, like, debt. Like, you know, when people think about, like, debt and, um you know, I'm doing a lot of door knocking at the moment for the election and everyone's really worried about the debt that Australia is racking up, right? Uh, and who's better financially managed? I think that's the way that young people see the climate in that, you know, this is, we can see how this is tangibly affecting our lives. Look at the bushfires, look at the floods. You know, we can see how this is tangibly affecting us um, and we need action on it or else it is going to be fatal it's you know the biggest um what was it what were they saying last night it's the biggest not military like what do you like threat mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know like you yeah. know talks about it yeah, yeah, yeah. like it's really it, I, I think it's how big the the threat is and the fact that we can like see it everywhere as well mm -hmm. So there's, there's climate justice, and sorry, I cut you off. You no, no, all good. So climate justice, um, a support for international students. We've seen that they've been completely cut off during the pandemic. Um, they're really, really struggling to get back on their feet. Mm -hmm. um, we want some quite tangible changes that would help them. So, you know, the fact is they pay taxes, so they should be allowed to use Medicare and not have to be forced onto other private health insurance, at least while they're here. Mm -hmm. That would make a massive massive difference to so many students stuff like letting them go on to normal public transport rates um and so that's know, they don't they don't get concession rates is that correct yeah so other students do but um international students are not eligible for concession rate travel yeah um and you know generally just like allowing a lot more support um, and support programs to be put in place to help them out. It's the thing that I didn't, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to catch up with it. What I hadn't realised, I always knew they weren't eligible for HEX. I never realised they were charged more for the exact same degree. So I thought, well, geez, that's a bit rough. No HEX and also paying more for the exact same degree. And I was told, you can tell me if this is right or not, that a lot of charities aren't actually funded to help international students, only residents. Yeah. But can yeah. I ask you, sorry, go ahead. No, you go. Sorry. I was going to say, can I ask you, when you talk about these campaigns to help international students, do you hear from people saying, well, hang on, they're international students, they must be rich, their parents are paying up front, they don't need help, why is this even an issue? Do domestic students uh, resent the attention or is there a conflict there? I mean, we definitely hear that. 
um, just the basic, like, you know, why did why do they get help? Their parents are rich, that kind of dialogue. Um, you know, but I also think I don't think that any domestic student that I was talking to was denying they had the hardest slog during COVID. Um, something that'll kind of come into my next point or campaign was, you know, we saw at Swinburne University last year, there was 450 students, international students, um, that had their, um, like, access to their LMS cut off because they paid their fees late. Um, the reason that they paid their fees late was because that was when the massive, like, COVID was massively gripping through India. Um, and many of those students, their families and parents were sick. Um, and so they're, you know, struggling to deal with that um, on an emotional level, but also when your parents and everyone back home is sick and you're still trying to, you know, when they're here, they're not able to get, you know, high-flying white-collar jobs, are they? They're working in hospo, they're working on the front line, they're working in as delivery drivers and, like, they're, you know, they're working in insecure, casualized work. Um, and there was just little to no help for them and their own university completely cut them off. Um, you know, some of those students, their parents had actually died and there was no remorse, no sorry from the university, just completely cutting them off from access to their education, to all of those services while demanding they pay these ridiculous fees. Um, it's quite cruel. Uh, and I think that a lot of domestic students saw that and um yeah that was and there's a huge you know, when, when anything happens in the world you know there's always that impact on those international students because as you said their families are in those countries and i know the uh, uh university in the united states there was a criticism from some students that they weren't doing enough for the ukrainian students because they were saying you know this conflict is happening but there are people at this university whose families you know are sending money for us now they can't and what are, we, what are we doing for those students? So yeah, it just shows that you know, how interconnected we are to, especially for international students when something happens overseas. Obviously. Sorry, your other campaign? Um, I think that one very much feeds into this idea that we want to introduce a legislative duty of care. Um, so that would basically, I mean, the initial push is just for a national inquiry um, into getting like a, like list basically very similar to the 55 recommendations um, of the Respect at Work report by Katie Jenkins, which came out of um, everything that was happening in Canberra. Um, and basically just having that, but for universities. So I think this would very much be our response to what happened with, um, like quite recently, there was the student safety survey came out, which was, um, a survey into sexual assault and harassment on university campuses, um, which the NUS worked quite hard on um, and were devastated by the results. We saw one in six students um, have been sexually harassed since starting university. Just a bit of a content warning on this section, if anybody listening um, can be triggered. But yeah, into that, um, we, the most concerning for me was the fact that one in two students didn't know where to report, didn't know the reporting mechanisms, and then didn't feel like they didn't know what the reporting mechanisms were or what the support services were available. And three fourths of the students that actually went through that whole program were re-traumatized by it or were not satisfied. Um, those are extremely concerning statistics and show that the universities, you know, are not picking up the slack. Um, we had a very similar survey come out in 2017, the 2017 change of course report, and the findings to now are not that different, despite the fact that we've also had a pandemic. So without that pandemic involved, you know, we can assume that the stats would have gone up, you know, if, if we've done this report, we find these big findings, we've got these recommendations, why aren't they being put in place? Um, and Is there so an answer for that? Well, I would blame the uh, monitoring body for the tertiary sector is called TEXA. Um, 
Texa was placed in charge after the 2017 change to the course of keeping universities to account on sexual assault mm-hmm. uh, and harassment, and they did not. They allowed universities to self-report. So a lot of universities were like, yes, yes, we've done this, we've done that, and um, they haven't. Um, and we know that because we're students on ground and we're talking to the student unions, uh, and they're not putting in these they're not putting in the recommendations um and so it's you know we have like um uh, the universe james cook university in queensland some of you might know they have like a strip like when you're walking from res to res the like from the bar to residential accommodation right and there's part of that strip that is without phone reception um, that has dodgy lighting that is you know near bushland and is like an open space and is really scary Um, and it's been brought up by the student union multiple times uh, and the university have said oh it's not like people are jumping out of bushes like that completely misses the point it's a it's a danger it's dangerous and you know we saw that obviously they're not listening because they had the one of I think they had the second highest um, at like 24% of students had faced sexual harassment on campus. You know, like that's, these are massive statistics. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I don't know. And your other campaign, should I ask, is Make Wage Theft the Crime one of them? I can see that uh, there it is. Oh, She's planned love- this, by the way, the, the, that board was completely blank and now she put all these posters up. No, no, I'm joking. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's actually quite. Look, there's a Medicare one. Yeah, that's right. Who's who's the guy behind you? That's Harry Styles. Oh, okay. No, I know that. That's One Direction, isn't it? Yes. Yes, you. Sure. And the person next to? Oh, this is this is Dior. These are um. It's a fashion thing, isn't it? Yeah, they're all they're all actually. This is Dior. This I'm, is. I'm out of my comfort zone. Let's go back to campaign. This is no, no. What was that? Uh, sorry. This is Cartier. That's oh, Cartier. Different. I know Cartier. This is Chanel. That's Rafu. Um, yeah. Don't. No, no, no. That's, oh, what was the last one you said? This, that's Rafu. It's a union. Oh, okay. I was going to say, is that a fashion brand? I know Cartier. And I thought, <laughs> I've never heard of that other one. You've got quite the mix of it's like fashion and like union merch. I don't <laughs> know. It just kind of happened, this board. We don't. It's, no, no, no. That's all right. <laughs> Um, I'm disappointed there's not any Carlton things. I have Carlton in front of me, but... Oh, that's right. It's an election year, so you've got to do the... You've got to wear the jerseys, hug the baby. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, now, sorry, there, the <laughs> there was a campaign... Sorry, we started talking about the, the board there with the, your other your other campaigns. And I know one of mm. them is the lowering the age of independence. Can you talk yes. a little bit about that? So... Lowering the age of independence, I think, is the one campaign that really reaches out to pretty much. I haven't talked to a student that hasn't been like, yeah, about it. Basically, the idea is that currently, until the age of 22, your income is wrapped up with your parents. And so you can't apply for things like Centrelink, which is really freaking annoying um, when you're like me and have lived out of the home for a really long time now and are still not considered independent despite working a lot. Um, basically we are advocating that they lower the age of independence from 22 down to 18 year by year. It's not a crazy controversial ask, um, but would allow so many students, um, to be able to access welfare that really, really need it. Uh, cause currently like if you do want to, if you are like independent, you're able to claim it and blah, blah, blah. There's still mountains and mountains of paperwork to fill out, which is really hard if you do not have a good relationship with your parents, which is the case for many students that actually need to access this. So, sorry, I've got a cough. Um, that, that's okay, you cough. I'll, I'll just say, so, so my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that you're on youth allowance, so lower payment until they're 22. Um, and even if you move out of home, when they judge how much they should give you, or it's based on, well, your parents' income. So even if you're not getting money from your parents, it's they kind of factor that in and go, well, you know, you, you don't need more than youth allowance because, you know, your parents presumably will give you money. 
Mm. Is that is that the? So you're not even able to access youth allowance a lot of the time. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, um, and you know that's also irrespective of the fact if you're moving different state away from your parents or if, um, like depending on how many kids your parents have, like that, you know, and I'm the cap is really I'm pretty sure it's fifty three thousand, mm. which is not that much. And like my parents have many, many children and, you know, that also makes it spread a bit thin because you've still got to like pay for all of these other mouths to feed and, you know, like everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just not taking that into account. Mm -hmm. So we, this is something that we've got a federal commitment to before. It was the NUS that managed to lower it from 26 to 22 in the first place. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it was the NUS back in the day. Uh, but now we've had a Liberal government for many, many years and I don't, you know, don't mind about any of your, like, political views or findings. However, we do really, you know, they have said that they will not commit to this um, and we're looking there's a lot more interest from other parties um on the left mm -hmm. side of things so that's what we're kind of pushing mm -hmm. for at the moment so that just means that the parents income won't be taken into account yeah and so they'll get more money well yeah, yeah. it'll it's basically you'll actually be deemed independent as mm -hmm. as you are at the end of the day if you're over 18 you're paying tax mm -hmm you're you know you have to do things like jury duty you have to do things like um i don't know what what's a, what's adult things you can you know go to war you can drive a car you can like all of these other things mm -hmm. but yet you're still not able to kind of like access the welfare mm -hmm. um and it's annoying like i went from being relatively in a job that i was relatively well paid last year and was paying my fair share of tax <laughs> um but yet yeah, now that I went to a much lower paid job I you know should technically be eligible for welfare but I'm not because my income is still with my parents um and you know my parents don't financially support me and I mm -hmm. don't ask them to um and you know they would probably struggle to afford that so it's really hard to like yeah, it's really, really annoying, tangibly. Um, and especially for students that move a long way from home. Like, I'm still able to go home to my parents for dinner when I don't really, you know, when I'm struggling for, din like, <laughs> dinner money and I can just go back home and get a free gig. Like, oh, love that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're especially moving, out, like, interstate, you don't have that. You don't have that support system. Um, and that's really, really hard. Can I ask you sort of the flip side of all of this? So these campaigns, how do you actually do the campaign? Are we, we're talking about contacting local members, sit-ins, what's the approach? Um, so we push for it a lot in, so we do like the official mechanisms, like we put in our pre-budget submission. Funnily enough, none of them uh, ended up in the budget, but you know, that's one way we kind of do it. But we also went up during budget week, um, which was a couple of two weeks ago now, um, and fought for it through that way. So it's, you know, going to all of the MPs offices and asking for their support, asking who they think we should talk to, who's like hard in caucus to kind of push through it. How do you find that process? Are they, do they welcome you? Do do you find it that they're generally productive, those meetings? Or is it nice to meet you, see you later? Um, depends on the party. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely depends on the party. I think, you know, it also depends who you're talking to in the party. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, is like if you're going into the Labour Party, for example, um, you have to, like a lot of them, the like the backbenchers, are uh, like will be really really supportive and they'll give you lots of ideas and they'll be great but they'll say look at the end of the day it's not my decision you have to talk to the minister so we have to talk to tanya mm -hmm. for example for age of independence like we have to talk to linda because she's um in charge of social services so mm -hmm. that's the kind of you know there's very much a mechanism for that but it's also about like the way that we were kind of dealing with it is like you know you can't necessarily be ignorant of the fact that factions exist within parties 
Um, and, you know, I'm lucky I, you know, come from quite a political background and I'm like kind of in the know of who's who with who mm -hmm. about building support within particular factions um, and having the numbers within caucus, which is where effectively the decision is going to be made so that it possibly can be pushed through. Mm -hmm. um, and generally it's just like a conversation, a very like hard earned conversation um, that'll be able to get you across the line with that. I think um, it was interesting going into the Greens because they've taken on a lot of our education policy and social welfare policy. Um, and so then it was like, like we were being asked for like how they could improve and we were like, whoa. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's a lot less hard to like, you know, lobby that. Um, and look, I'm going to be honest, we didn't really get in the rooms of many libs, um, which I suppose is fair enough. We've been very, no, I don't, it's not fair enough, but, you know, we've been pretty critical of them. Um, as we would be of any party of government. But I think, um, yeah, that's mu they're much harder conversations to have. What about with the media? Do you engage much with the media? Are they receptive to your campaigns and your... Yeah. Um, we're really, really lucky. We work with a lot of media teams um, and a lot of different other youth orgs, which is something we've really tried to be working on this year. Because um, we're all fighting very, very similar fights. Um, so on the Change the Age campaign, for example, we're working a lot with um, FYA, which is the Foundation for Young Australians, uh, and they have given us a secondment, so a bit of extra funding to help us fund the campaign because um, obviously we're pretty freaking broke. So <laughs> all the extra money um, and an extra staff member at the moment actually really, really helps us. Um, but, yeah, the media's been really good. We've been able to get a couple of pieces in. Me and Luke wrote an op-ed for the Herald Sun and The Age. Oh, the okay. Actually, nothing so about it. So if people want to read that, what do they type in? This is, a, this is an ad. Yeah, it's called, well, they changed the title on this. But if you, like, maybe just typing my name and it comes up might be the easiest. But it's, um, it's like, students were, like, left out in this budget. Um. Um, and we talked about the budget and how that, like, was effective on students. Um, and... Do you get much support from business in terms of any of your campaigns or, or, or support? Do they see any value when, you know, uh, making sure that, you know, good university is good for business, that sort of thing, or not really? You mean, like... In supporting your campaigns, like you talk about talking to politicians, uh, obviously students are engaged, but I just wondered if the private sector engaged at all in any of these issues to do with university funding and students because they can kind of potentially see, well, that's a good thing if we have happy students that do well and because they're coming into our workplaces. So we'll, we'll support that. Yeah, um, not really. I think everyone's a bit scared of the whole union aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think something that I really want to start working on going forward is, you know, looking at the massive hospo shortages we're seeing at the moment, talking about they wedge left of crime, but, um, which is a commitment, by the way, by a major party going into the federal election. So we love that. But anyway. Um, I know it's important, make wage theft the crime. So true. Um, as someone that's dealt with a fair bit of wage theft I think that working with business around increasing hospital wages um I think quite frankly you know we're gonna like there's a lot of talk about all of this hospital shortages and blah, blah 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 and yeah it's a real problem but you know I think it's a problem that has a very easy solution in that if you're asking you know it's students most of the time that are doing these hospital jobs um it's you know, hard to justify to them why they should work in a sector where, you know, they're going to get abused, they're, you know, it's rough, it's normally terrible working conditions, there are times where they want to be out with their friends or they need to be studying, but, you know, and it's a job that's increasingly casualised, it's insecure, you can get fired at any time because they always put you in casual positions and they pay you like absolute crap. Yeah. And, you know, why would they work in that kind of sector when they could, you know, be trying to get a job in, like, somewhere else? Mm 
um, especially after COVID. I mean, I lost my job during COVID working at like retail store. Oh. Um, Sorry just, to hear that. Yeah, well, it was crap, but it was just, I mean, I was working at Burke Street, which is on the main strip mm-hmm. and um, they like just like weren't getting any customers or whatever. And so the shop folded down and they moved me out to Epping and then they weren't getting any customers and they were broke and the shop closed down and I lost my job. And, you know, I was fine. I'm, you know, buffed myself up. I got another job, but some people aren't that lucky. Um, hey, can I ask you about support from churches? Do you get much support from church groups or anything like that? And it's okay to say no. Don't, don't, uh... um, not, not really at an NUS level, but I know that we work, like a lot of student unions work a lot quite closely with their Christian organisations and um, churches and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, the NUS, not really. Oh, OK. okay. Well, I'm glad there's some involvement because um, the, the, we're, all, we're all taught to help people in need and to get out there, and, you know. So they would be the, or should be, the, you know, the, 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 the most active groups on any, on any issue, especially, you know, for students and, uh, and helping those that are struggling. Um, what can people do for, for you guys, for people watching this or who will watch this? And I should just say, for those of you watching, going, why didn't you ask her about this or this? You can still ask these questions. Just send them in to a send a Facebook message or contact NUS directly. But how can people watching help? Um, I think get involved in your student union, join up, um, is always incredible, incredibly helpful. Um, and get around all of the protests and stuff that we do and the activism that happens at a student union level. Um, I think following us on social media, <laughs> not to plug, no, no, no. Plug, plug away, at, plug away. At National Union of Students. I'm trying really hard with the graphics at the moment. I think they're really cool. And we've got a new graphics person on and she's amazing. Her name's Helia. So, like, I think we're good to follow and we provide good info. Um Donations? Pardon? Donations? Can people make donations to NUS? Um, we're not technically a registered charity. Oh, okay. So I think it's complicated. Yeah. I think you can, but it's like yeah. hard. But yeah, like if you're really loaded and like we're interested, then that's something we'd very much be like. We're always okay. in good funding. Um, but that's so not if you're loaded, right. getting I don't, contact. I don't do the finance. I'm yeah. really bad at finance. So that goes to the general secretary of yeah. the unions. And I know you have petitions that people yes. can sign and things like that. We have lots of petitions chain, doing the um, change the age petition, which I believe has been signed up, is really, really helpful. We're trying to um, get that to a couple more signatures. Um, and I think the engagement and like, yeah, like coming out to protests and stuff when we have them and days of action. Ask about the protests. Are they, did you view them as, as effective or are they more about sort of just having that presence? How do you find protests in general? It's a good question. Um, the NUS of old used to do like massive protests. Like we used to be really good at them um these back days in the old days we used to go to these the protest day. thing we were there early in the morning we had cool signs yeah now COVID's really like hurt a lot of that ability um but i'm a big believer that you know we need to do both um it's important to lobby it's important to kind of go through those you know tangible like means um and to go on the inside but it's also so incredibly important to be standing on the street. Um, I believe political change can only be done in consultation with a social movement. And that social movement needs to be on the streets. It needs to be protests. It needs to be, you know, loud and annoying to a certain extent. Um, I think nowadays just like because of COVID has really hurt the ability to protest. Um, it's a lot harder, but I think in the coming years, um, we're going to see that really jump back up again. And I'm really, really excited to see that happen. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for joining. It was absolutely wonderful um, to have this chat with you and to learn about what you're doing. And you're doing very important things. I mean, you're literally helping people. You can't there's anything more important than, than that. Uh, thank you for the for the background um, images and uh, of, of uh, make wage death a crime and Dior. Uh, for some reason, I thought that was uh, Emma Thompson. I was way off. 
Um, but thank you again so much, Georgia, for joining. Um, and we'll hopefully talk soon. Yes. Thank you so much for having me.